you'll please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 13. We'll be looking at verses 10 through 17 this morning. We have finished up our study on the book of Ephesians, and for the summer, we will be looking at the parables in the book of Matthew. And so we want to understand what is the purpose of the parables before we begin the study of the parables. Let me give you this story. Some years ago, a little boy about 10 years old was standing before a shoe store on the roadway barefooted, peering through the window and shivering with cold. A lady approached the young boy and said, my, but you are in such deep thought staring in that window. The boy responded, I was asking God to give me a pair of shoes. So the lady took him by the hand, went into the store and asked the clerk to get half a dozen pair of socks for the boy. She then asked if he could get her a basin of water and a towel, and he quickly brought them to her. She took the little fellow to the back part of the store and removing her gloves, knelt down, washed his little feet and dried them with a towel. And by this time, the clerk had returned with the socks. So placing a pair upon the boy's feet, she purchased him a pair of shoes. She tied up the remaining pairs of socks and gave them to him. She patted him on the head and said, no doubt you'll be more comfortable now. And as she turned to go, the astonished kid caught her by the hand and looking up into her face with tears in his eyes, asked her, are you God's wife? (laughs) Stories, parables, fables, short stories that give a point. They make an impact. And a lot of times they are far greater in their shortness and their directedness than novels that are written. So we want to understand why it is that Jesus spoke in parables. What was the purpose and why, was they, why were they given? So we're going to be looking at Matthew 13 verses 10 through 17 this morning where Jesus tells his disciples the purpose of the parables. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, And hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's hearts have grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them." But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is to you and to you alone that we run to for understanding in regards to this passage, but more importantly, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to move to open our eyes and our hearts and our ears to hear the truths of your scripture, the words that you've given to us that bring life to some and death to others. So Father, please allow your Holy Spirit to move in this place, for if he is not here, then we waste our time. And so Father, you lead, you guide, But more importantly, you speak. Then let us hear and understand and apply what it is that you're about to teach us. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So what are parables? Let's begin by giving an overview in regards to the synoptic gospels. And what I mean by that is each one of the gospel writers gave a different purpose for their writing of the book. And so if we looked and looked at the book of Mark, uh, we would see that Mark focuses Jesus being the son of man, 
That was his focus more than anything else. If you were to look at Luke, Luke focused on Jesus being the servant of all. But Matthew, where we're going to be looking at the, the parables in the book of Matthew specifically, Matthew focuses on the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be a part of the kingdom of God? What does it mean to find the kingdom of God? What does it mean to be uh, tempted to leave the kingdom of God by Satan? What does it mean to overcome Satan in regards to the, to, to the kingdom of God? And so you need to keep in mind that a lot of the parables that we're going to be studying has the overarching principle of the kingdom and the king. And so as we begin to unpack that, we need to go to the specific definition. And for our purposes, a parable is a simple story that's used to illustrate a spiritual lesson. A simple story that's used to illustrate a spiritual lesson. Now, there are different types of parables. There are true parables, and true parables are ones that have obvious truths that are found in life or usually can be found in present day living. So everybody understood when you put yeast in dough that it rises. Everybody would have understood things of children playing in a marketplace. So there are things that are in everyday life that are everyday truths that we know about. And so when they're told in a parable, we would go, oh, I understand what that means. And so that would be a true parable. There's also story parables. Now, story parables are usually told about events in the past. And there's stories about an event or something specifically that happened, but it's not about the facts of the story that's the most important, but the truths that are being revealed. So there's things like the persistent widow or the farmer. It's just, it's a farmer. And the farmer see, uh, goes out and sows good seed. And then the people who are, are evil, his enemies come in and put the weeds among the good seed. So these are story parables. But then there's a third kind called illustrations. These are example stories. And so these are either things that are either imitated or there's things to be avoided. So this is where you would see like the Good Samaritan. You want to be the Good Samaritan. You don't want to be like the religious people. Or it could be the Pharisee and the tax collector. You don't want to be the Pharisee in the story. You want to be the tax collector. So they're illustrations. So we look at the different types that God brings into the midst of the, the kingdom parables. And so we're going to see these different types being unfolded. So what is the purpose, though, of the parable? Well, one of the things that we need to understand is that we're to remember the parables. So a lot of times they're stories that are easily remembered. So probably in the midst of my sermon today, if you remember nothing else except the story that I began with, then you're doing okay. If you begin to grasp and understand that you are supposed to be the answer to the prayers of people on behalf of God, that's not a bad thing. So there's stories that are easily remembered. It's usually about bold characters. And then they're also filled with rich symbolism. Now, we need to understand as we remember these stories, and again, uh, we hope that they're rememberable stories, but there's the application of it. Now, we need to be very careful because not every detail has a secret or a specific meaning in every parable. You don't need to try to figure out everything. Because the parable, listen, has one purpose. One. So when you talk about the parable of the mustard seed and it being the smallest seeds that grows into the biggest plant or in the biggest tree, depending on your translation, and it says that the birds come and nest in it, you don't worry about who the birds are. We don't need to know what kind of bird they were. We, know, we don't need to know why it's a bird and not a squirrel. It doesn't matter. The point is that it goes from the smallest to the largest. So we need to make sure that we're cautious and we figure out what is the one purpose of the parable. Now, we also need to be careful in our applications. So again, we need to make sure that we're taking what's happening in the scripture, in the parable, and make sure that we're applying the truth principles to us. 
And so that means that when we go to the, the parable of the, the teaching of the parables, it's not teaching light. These aren't pithy stories that don't have any meaning or shouldn't uh, apply to us or shouldn't impact us or shouldn't drive us to the cross. This is, this is as real as reading Revelation. It's as real as the narrative stories. It's as real as the poetry of David. We should understand and grasp and say, how do I apply the parables to my life? So that is why Jesus comes and he begins to speak in parables. Now, he also does it in something that I think for us, if we're honest, um, becomes troublesome. Because remember what happens here? The, 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 his disciples come and say, why are you speaking in parables to the crowd? Because up until this moment, Jesus has been teaching plainly, openly. So why does he change his, his way of teaching to now speaking in parables. Now we need to unpack this a little bit because Jesus' methodology has a couple of purposes. The first one is it came from the word, it was prophesied. It's what Neil read for us already. He quotes Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. Now again, put it back into context. Isaiah comes, he comes into a place where the holiness of God is expanded before him. Now, again, I truly want you to grasp this because the seraphim are flying. They are so overwhelmed. They won't even look at the holy God. And these are heavenly beings. They won't stand in front of a holy God. They're crying out before a holy God as as much as they possibly can because they repeat it three times. For us, we would have put exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. They're saying, holy Holy, holy. Now, I wish my voice was so loud and I wish my voice was so bass oriented that you would actually rumble in your seats. Because that's the understanding of what these beings are crying out. And they said the smoke filled the temple and his robe. And we understand this a little bit because any of you have ever looked at the royal family and you've ever saw them do things like weddings or the funerals or anything like that. If they are wearing something where they have to have the robe, the bigger the robe, the more important the person. Now, when God puts into place that his robe filled the temple, that's a big robe. He is saying to us, I am so other than you. I am so holy that when Isaiah comes into his presence, he is undone. And he looks and he says, I am so unworthy to be here. And then he has something that we're not appreciative of. One of the seraphim goes, takes, uh, he has to take tongs. And he takes the coal from the fire and places it upon Isaiah's lips. And then God asks a question, who will go for us? Now, this is what I don't understand about Isaiah. And maybe because this is, this is where I'm a jerk and Isaiah's not, I don't know. When God asked that question, I would have said, what do you mean go for you? Isaiah, listen, with blistered lips, says, here I am, send me. And then God gives to him what Jesus quotes. I'm going to give you a ministry, Isaiah, where you're going to go and you're going to speak to the people of God, and they're not going to listen to you. How's that for a call to ministry? Jeff, I want you to come and you're going to have a church where you're going to be preaching the gospel and not one person in your congregation is going to want to live for Jesus. But continue to preach. Continue to be faithful. So Jesus is saying he has been called to a ministry where he comes and ultimately did you see only 10% That's the number that he gave the remnant will be the ones to be found faithful. 
So he takes the word of the prophecy, but he also goes to a second part of prophecy where it defines him as the Messiah. Because if you go to Psalm 78, verse 2, it was a, this is a Christological psalm, so it's pointed to the Christ, and it says this, that this is what the Messiah would do. For I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings from of old. So Jesus, by what he's doing, is defining himself before the people. He is the Messiah. I am the one that you have been waiting for. And so he sets himself up from the prophecy. He sets himself up as the Messiah, but he comes giving the secrets of the kingdom. Now, we have to kind of unpack this a little bit. See, what I get called to do and what you pay me to do is to do due preparation for the preaching. So I'm supposed to be preparing. I'm supposed to rightly expound the word of God. And that's true. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Harry Reeder, uh, who's up in Birmingham at one of the, I don't know if it's the biggest church, but definitely one of the biggest churches in the PCA, said this. He said one, one week he spent a lot of time preparing for his sermon, gave a lot of time, great examples, great illustrations, and thought, oh, God's really going to bless. And he went and he spoke it to the congregation there in Alabama, and he said it was crickets. Not one thing. He was a little ticked off. He was like, God, you know, I did all of this for you. I prepared, I, I was ready. And nothing, no response. He said a few weeks later, he found himself in Kenya doing some talks to the, to the people there. And uh, they kept asking him to preach more. You preach again, you preach again, you preach again. And they found themselves having about a thousand teenagers um, coming for this event. And they said, you need to come preach to the teenagers. And he says, I've run out of material. I've preached everything that I brought with me and brought over here. And they said, too bad, you got to preach again. And so he looked through his Bible and lo and behold, there were the notes from the sermon that he preached where he got crickets and he goes, well, this will be really exciting. So he preached the sermon and it had to be translated and it had to be translated actually a couple of times because of the multiple dialects. And at the end of the service, as he was closing, 125 kids came forward to give their life to Christ. And Harry Reader said, I think you translated it wrong. And so he went back to the translators and he said, I really do think you've translated incorrectly what I have said. And they're like, no, we translated your four points exactly. And he's like, I'm telling you, you need to translate it again. And you need to translate it again correctly this time. And so they translated it again. And another hundred kids came forward. 250, a quarter of the kids that were there gave their lives to Christ. So what's the difference? It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. It's prayer. Listen, I can do everything right. I, can be, I could be the most entertaining preacher to you. I could, I could have all the right examples. I can do everything. But if the Spirit's not moving in here, it doesn't matter. It's the spirit that moves and we all need to be praying, not just me, but you should be praying, God, you speak to me as well as me speak to you, the truths of the scripture. See, we should have prayer as the, the one spot that truly begins to grasp so that we understand its importance and it begins with all aspects. It begins with the preparation of praying and, uh, as I begin the process, but it also applies to the application. All right, so God, we've heard this. Now, how do I apply it to my life? How does it begin to change other people around me? So we need to be people of prayer, and especially in regards to the teaching, because it's the Holy Spirit who transforms. And again, when we allow him, when we ask him, he will answer. And so we need to be praying, change me. But it only happens through the Holy Spirit. 
Because the Holy Spirit, again, can only speak the truth that he's been given. And then he speaks truth to those who are Christians. So again, every time that we come into contact with each other, it should be we're speaking Christ to one another. And so when you are confronted, um, again, we've said this, and again, the, I know some of the teenagers have been taught this now that are young professionals and stuff. One of the things that Owen and I used to say all the time, when you would confront someone in love with the truths of the scripture, if they responded by biting, then maybe they were a wolf. Because if you responded in love and confronted somebody in love and they were a Christian, they would bleep like a wounded sheep. So maybe when you're confronted or somebody comes up and tries to tell you truth from the scripture and you respond with, get the heck out of here, that would scare me. See, we're supposed to be allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us. John 16, 13 says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit moves, and as the Holy Spirit moves, he transforms us. And what does he transform us into? Into the likeness of Jesus Christ. He can't tra transform us into anything else. He can't. Unable. But as he moves, he transforms us and draws us closer to who Jesus Christ is. Now, here's the part where a lot of people get upset because Jesus has said effectively, and the scripture said effectively, that I'm going to conceal and I'm going to reveal to others. Now, we look at that and kind of go, that is really mean. Jesus, why aren't you revealing to everybody? Now, I want you to grasp and understand that context matters. That's why you're not a one-verse congregation. We don't go to the Bible and pick out one verse and start to say, well, see, this is what the Bible says. That might be what that verse says, but what does the Bible big picture say? How does Scripture define Scripture? And so what's happening at this point is Jesus is talking to the crowds in parables. Now, he's doing this because he's already spoken plainly about him being the Messiah. He's already showed himself to be the Messiah. He's already said these things to people. And so now he's getting some pushback. People are unbelieving. There's the rejection of the Messiah, specifically by who? The religious people. And there are opposition. So Jesus goes to a means where he begins to speak parables to the crowds. And it's even so much so that, again, the disciples say, why, why change the methodology? You spoke so plainly. Why are you now speaking in parables? And he says to them, because it is a stumbling block to those who don't know. They don't have ears to hear or hearts to understand. Listen, we, left unto ourselves, want to exclude God. We want to exclude God from our thoughts and our lives. All of us. I want to do what I want to do, the way I want to do it, in my timing, for my purposes, for my goals. Remember the, for those that are older, even older than I, you remember the song, The Boxer by Paul Simon? He's got a great line in there. He says, still a man hears what he wants to hear, and he disregards the rest. That's true today as it was back then. It's true in Jesus' time. We hear what we want to hear. That's why the scripture makes a distinction between the fool, the wise man, but he also says there's a scoffer. See, the fool doesn't know any better. And you, we've met those kind of people. If you don't know something or, or whatever, you come in and you look silly. You ask someone who's never been a part of putting on football equipment to come in the locker room and put on football equipment, and you start seeing putting things on backwards or whatever, you start to laugh. Let me teach you. Let me teach you the right way to put it on. Then the wise man would say, oh, I've been taught. I know the truth. I know how to put on the equipment the right way. So I'm going to put on the equipment the right way. But then there's others who come in and say, I know how to put their equipment on the right way, but I'm not going to do that. So I would have players who would come in and take their thigh pads out. Why are you taking your thigh pads out? 
because I need to be fast, coach. You do understand that if someone hits you with their helmet in your thigh, that they could break your femur. You do understand that, don't you? Coach, I've got to be fast. You're a scoffer. You know the truth, but you won't apply it. That's who Jesus is speaking to. He's saying these people in the crowds are scoffers. They know the truth. They heard the clear teachings. And they don't apply them. So he goes to a parable, and he goes to a parable because he wants them to hear these stories that they might remember. I remember very clearly one of the teachers in our congregation saying that she loves Christmas time because Christmas time is where, because of the, the differences of the um, people around the world and how they celebrate it, she can go clearly and give the gospel presentation. We can take the truths of Scripture and make them into stories. And the people in our schools and in our businesses and our, our neighborhoods and stuff will go, man, that's a great story. Without ever knowing it comes from the Scripture. Be wise and apply the word. But for those who have ears to hear, he reveals. Which means if you are here today and you know Christ, when you hear the words of Scripture, it brings you life. And so what he does, he says to the disciples, hey, I'm preaching to the crowds and parables, but he explains in private what is the meaning of the parable. He answers them. He teaches them. He disciples them. And in discipling them, they're able to see and they're able to hear the story and apply it to their lives. Oh, this is what it means. And when it does that, it becomes a blessing. Why do I say it becomes a blessing? Because our spiritual understanding is developed. The more that we are able to grasp and understand, it's why we can now go to, if you're a Christian, you go to the ocean and you're overwhelmed by the power. Because you know the creator. And so you're able to see the power of the ocean. You're able to see the wind of a hurricane and be able to apply to scripture and say where God says to us very clearly, you, see, you hear the wind, but you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it's going. So is those who are born of the spirit. Now, I don't want you to think of like a gentle wind on your cheek. Think of the hurricane. Quit putting God in a box. God is not someone you can control. And God in his greatness comes to us and he says, I want you to grow in your understanding of who I am. And he says very clearly to the disciples, hey, the people back in the Old Testament, they long to see what you see. They would have come here and they would have been overwhelmed of saying how long we waited to have the Holy Spirit come to us. And so it's this overwhelming desire to know him and so it should motivate us. It should motivate us to be the believers because, again, everything that was longed for, we have received in Christ. And so he tells us, now as you hear, go and do. Build the kingdom. Keep moving forward no matter the trials or tribulations you, you find yourself. Pray. Pray for our young people specifically. They live in a day that's worse than I never thought we'd be here as a country. So are we praying for the young people? That they might be found faithful. That they might not sit around and compromise because their ears are tickled or try to fit in with their friends because what they believe is so contrary or so antiquated. Are they strong enough and have we come alongside them? Not just push them out there and say, yeah, go take care of this professor. Yeah, go take care of this. Go be this in your schools. Are we coming alongside them? Are we praying for them? Are we letting them know we're praying for them? Because God's kingdom wins. We are on the right side. And we have the victory. And God's kingdom will be built. And you know the cool thing? Is he wants you to be a part of it. Those that have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand, he's called you. 
to the ministry. You are the missionary. You are the preacher. You are the hope. You are, listen, the story that people see. So be encouraged, especially this summer as we come and we start to unpack these parables. Ask and say, God, how are you going to change me to look more like our Savior every time I come? And then send me, even if it's going to be hard. Are people going to like it when you go and tell them about Jesus at, at your place of business? No. Are people going to cuss you out? Maybe. Listen, I, I, I hate telling people what I do. I hate it. Because either they start to, 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 to ask for forgiveness. Oh, sorry, I've been saying some bad words. The pastor's here, can't say it. Or they cuss more. <laughs> they do. Because they're trying to get at me. Because what they're saying to us, I hate you. Because you stand in the way of what I want to hear and what I want to do. And I hate you as much as I hate Jesus Christ. So be called and be faithful. Put on the armor of God, but don't sit back. Go onward and assail the gates of hell itself. God uses you. Just be available. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, easy words to say, hard words to put into practice because none of us like to be made fun of and none of us like to lose our job because we brought something into, into the work area that we weren't supposed to. We don't want to affect relationships with our neighbors. We don't want to have arguments with our family members. But Father, this is the only truth that can save them. And so Father, I would ask that you would raise the zeal and the power and the desire to preach the gospel message to all who might have ears to hear and hearts to understand May we be diligent to pray, especially for those loss that you put upon our hearts. Lord, that we would not only pray for them, and Lord, that's a huge thing, but Lord, that we would live it out. And as we live it out, Lord, that we would preach the gospel so that they too might come and worship you as their Lord and Savior. So Father, may we look forward to the summer of parables again so that we might look more like Jesus than when we started. For we pray all this in Christ's precious name and by the power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen.